Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I greatly appreciate your time, especially coming in after a break. I know there's the temptation just to stay out there and keep chit-chatting, so I do appreciate everyone coming back in. My name is Bob Walker, and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about the lessons that I learned building a deployment process for over 150 different developers. If you're interested in getting in touch with me, um, I wanted to include a bunch more details, especially like how can you apply some of these lessons. However, you know, we are limited by time, and I could go on for hours and hours on something like this. So please feel free to reach out to me. All my contact information is up there. Uh, you can see LinkedIn, GitHub, all that other good stuff. Now, you can see I've been working at Octopus Deploy since 2018. But prior to working at Octopus Deploy, I was, in fact, an Octopus Deploy customer. Sorry, did, I can go back. <laughs> uh, I was, in fact, an Octopus Deploy customer. And this story really is about how I got introduced into that whole process. So this story starts back when I was working at Farm Credit Services of America. And if you're not familiar with Farm Credit Services of America, don't worry, most people are not. It's ostensibly a credit union for farmers. And I'm going to be using a framing device today to tell you about the lessons that I learned, which was automating database deployments. And if you've ever automated database deployments, you know sometimes it's like talking to a brick wall. So we need a starting point for this, this particular story. And there are going to be 10 lessons that I'm going to teach you today, but I'm going to start out with zero, because I'm a developer, and I want to start at an index base zero, not starting at one. And that is that processes are a culmination of mistakes and reactions. So the process and what I'm about to tell you, this wasn't something that we just started and hoped for the best type of thing. This was more of a case of I walked into this after 10, 15 years of all of these mistakes and reactions to this. So what we had is we had two plus hour deployments that we had to deal with. And this is primarily due to the fact that I was working on one of the more complex applications at the time, which was the loan origination system. Uh, we had over 5,000 different database objects that we were responsible for. Um, I can get into great detail as to how we had 5,000 database objects. And so our deployments, while they were really two hours, is really 30 minutes of deployment time and then 90 minutes of verification and then fixing everything. And this is because we had so many different objects and I'll also get into the reason why we had to spend so much time verifying. But at the end of the day, no matter how much time we spent verifying, the tricky thing that we had is we always missed something. We always made some stupid mistake. And that always, almost, I would say 60% of the time, resulted in some sort of emergency fix the next day. And that wasn't a result of like we had to do some sort of big push the next day. It was I had to push out a uh, store procedure or a view or something ridiculous. It just went outside the normal deployment window. Um, I couldn't help myself when I was putting together this slide deck when I saw that 60% number. You know, 60% of the time it fails every time. Um, so primarily this was caused by the fact of how we tracked our changes. And it was exceptionally manual in terms of how we did these types of changes. We had developers and database developers making changes to our database. And if you've never automated your database deployments, um, how you track those changes can be rather wild at times. Uh, we tracked it all on a piece of paper that was stuck on the database developer's cubicle wall. Other teams, they had a bit more of a high-tech approach where they were using Microsoft Word or Excel spreadsheets. So we were really high tech in that sense. We compounded the fact with how we delivered our changes. So our developers, they were sysadmins in dev and test. And the DBAs, they were sysadmins in staging and production. And because of this, we had a wildly inconsistent approach of how we made our deployments. How we deployed to dev and test was vastly different than how we deployed to staging and production. Even worse, is that because developers were sysadmins and dev and test, we could just create whatever accounts we wanted. So we pointed all our local machines up to test. And that's because that's where QA tested. That's where our business owners tested. That's where all that good testing data existed. And then when we wanted to go to staging and production, we were manually generating these scripts, these change scripts. And then when we felt like it, we would go back through and we'd update development. That was like a once a fortnight type of thing or once a month. Like, oh my gosh, look how different it is. We got to fix that. Deploying to production, that was a bit of a case of, you know, we would just 
have the database developer and the DBA go back and forth and they'd submit a Word doc and we'd put files in a file share. It was good times. And then we went to production. By the time we got there, it was like, was this gonna work? And it was, maybe, probably not. 60% of the time it didn't. So this is probably where I'm going to tell you that automation should fix all of those problems, right? It's gonna solve every single one of your problems. We just start gotta automating everything. And the reason why I spent the last five-ish minutes or so talking about this terrible, terrible process was because to highlight the very first lesson, which is if you automate a terrible process, you don't make it any less terrible. I wanted to solve this problem. And so I had, I, I go to the school of hard knocks. I like to learn problem, I like to learn these lessons the hardest way possible and do all the, make all these mistakes myself. And so I was like, what we need to do is we just need to automate all of our script creation. That's going to solve all of our problems. Never mind the fact of how we track our changes and the fact we have an inconsistent process. No. The problem is, is how we generate the scripts. So I set about doing that. So let's solve that. Let's going to do this. And everything's going to be awesome, right? And so what I ended up doing was before I had a manual process that I was smash. Basically, I was smashing myself in the face with the pie manually. Now I developed a way to automatically smash myself in the face. So that brings me to my second lesson. Don't be afraid of significant change when you want to solve these types of problems. And I'll get into what I mean by significant change in just a second. But I never stepped back and I never asked these big questions as to are we solving the right problem? And honestly, you could swap out the database specific bits in here and easily replace that with code. You know, should, you know, are we reviewing before you go to production for your code base, is that the right time? Almost universally, I'd say everyone in this room would say absolutely not. You should be doing that before you merge into main. But those are the types of the big types of questions that we needed to ask. And we had a significant amount of changes coming down the pike. Um, there's a big business initiative, and we just recognized that the current process was just unsustainable, and we had to fix it. Now, the funny thing was is that that process that I put together, I automated the script creation. It was basically a way for me to get around interacting with the DBAs, because the DBAs, they're mean and crusty, and they're, they're always the big fun haters in the group. So I want to introduce you to one of the scariest looking DBAs I've ever met in my life. So his name is John Morehouse. I give this talk, I've given versions of this talk all the time. John's very aware that I use his picture, so he's perfectly fine with it. Um, but John is much taller than me. He's always had that shaved head. He has always had that beard. And when he walks around and if he doesn't smile, he's an absolutely intimidating individual. In fact, his Twitter handle was DBA with a bat. And it was a picture of him not smiling, holding a baseball bat because he was about ready to crack some skulls for the developers who were messing up his life. But he said, we needed to fix this problem because from a DBA point of view, it was the wild west of how we did our database deployments. No team followed a consistent process whatsoever. That's why I'm wearing the hat today is it's the wild west over there. So now that I've used that joke up, I'm gonna go ahead and take that off because it's actually really hot. So, what we decided to do is there was a lot of problems that we needed to solve. But the, one of the biggest problems was we had way too many cooks in the kitchen trying to solve all these problems. And so what we said was we need to empower some individuals and we need to come together with a, basically at a two-day summit. We also wanted to bring in some vendors to help us out with, solve some of these problems. And so we said, okay, let's get the key representatives from each group into a room and let's come up with a way to solve this. And so... I was the lead developer that they picked. I like to think they picked me because I was the, the person who was trying to automate away some of the problems. I just happened to be working on the most complex application at the time. And they figured, hey, if I solve it for the most complex application, we're going to solve it for everybody else. Um, so it's kind of a right, right case, right, right place, right time on something like that. But when I got into that meeting, I was like a bull in the china shop. Because I was like, oh, look at this. So we wrote up our process of our current state. Say, oh, we're going to automate that, we're going to automate that, we're going to automate that. That's what the vendor is going to tell us. But that brings me to my fourth lesson, which is 
focus on the process first that you want to implement. Excuse me, focus on the rules first, not the process. Focus on your business rules first, then focus on the process, and then focus on the tooling. I did it the reverse way. I was focused on the tooling, and then the process, and then the rules, and try to make everything fit. And the simple fact of the matter was is the business rules that we came up with, the initial ones, they weren't super earth shattering. I mean, I'm saying, you know, changes must be reviewed. That's, I mean, that's bog standard everywhere. Changes must be reviewed by someone who didn't make the change. That's, that's earth shattering. When it came to the database, we needed to have a truth center for our changes. That was the big one for us. That was a big change and something that was auditable that we can link back to a business change request. The other one is we needed to have a consistent process across all our environments because by the time we would go to staging, it would, we'd always run into headaches and it's never worked out. So we needed to solve solving these problems sooner. So the process changes that we came up with, that was a bit different for us, which was, okay, we need to put the database into source control because that's one of the biggest rules. When I say that, I mean the schema, not the actual database data itself require local database development. And by doing that, we could leverage feature branches and get all the good stuff that comes around with feature branches, such as pull requests and everything like that. And then it came time to start working on the tools. So again, rules, process, tools. And this happened a significant amount of time ago. Um, so raise the hands. I'm just genuinely curious. How many people in here use Team Foundation version control? No one? Man, I'm old. All right, so if you haven't had the pleasure, which no one in this room has, um, it is the absolute worst version control system when it comes to creating branches. So we made the decision we're gonna go, go to Git. And so again, this was almost 10 years ago at this point, so Git on Windows was a pretty big deal. Did anyone deal with, team, I'm, I'm gonna probably guess no, but did anyone deal with Team Foundation server for their builds? Again, no, man, one person. XAML builds suck, don't they? 100%, yes. So we opted to go for, at the time, it was called Visual Studio Team Services, or Team System, or VSTS. Now it's called Azure DevOps. For our consistent process, consistent having consistent deployment process, we opted for Octopus Deploy, no big surprise there. Um, and then we opted for RedGates tooling because we're leveraging SQL Server. So then that's how we got our pull request process built in. And it was really easy for us to link our business rules back to our process, back to our tools. Very easy to do all that now. One of the biggest issues that we had and where everything failed for us was around that consistent process across all environments. Having something that was consistent in dev, test, staging, and prod. Because again, we didn't take away developers' access to test. They were still sysadmins. So, we came up with the decision of, we're gonna be really harsh about this. Basically, if you don't follow this process, if you make a change in tests and it's not committed into source control, we're gonna overwrite that the next time we deploy out to test. It was a way to enforce it. So that brings me to my fifth lesson, which is knowing when to say no. We needed to have the way in place to have this type of enforcement. And I can, I can guarantee every single developer, when we started rolling this out, ran up to me in a huff. It said, I just lost a morning's worth of work in the database. I just lost, you know, I, afternoon's worth of work. We just overrode all my changes. Like, I told you what would happen. I told you to your face what would happen, and you chose to ignore me. But this was the reason why we kept failing all of the time with our implementation for automated deployments because we didn't enforce the process. I'll get into the, a little bit, I'll get into uh, why being pig-headed is a bad thing. But one thing I learned was no process is ever static though. And what I mean by that is that as you learn the tooling better, as you understand it, you're also gonna discover that certain rules can be interpreted in different ways. As long as you are following the core rules and everyone can agree to those core rules, you might say, I don't really need that step. So the lesson that I would wanna encourage you to take away from this is that don't try to design the most, world's most perfect process from the get-go. 
because it's gonna, you're going to iterate on it anyway. It's almost going to be a throwaway. So just treat it like code. Iterate. Make improvements. Make it better. So I want to spend the remainder amount of time talking about lessons I've learned since then that it, I wish I applied back then. Like, I wish I had this knowledge. Who in here has seen the Seinfeld episode, The Jerk Store? Remember when George was driving away and he's just like screaming at himself saying, I should have said this? So this is a lot like that. I wish it was one of those cases of, I wish I said that or I wish I knew this type of thing. So I talked a little bit about, you know, how I was a bit more pig-headed and say, no, we're not going to change this process whatsoever. No, we're going to overwrite those changes. I wish I knew that I needed to ask why. And I never asked why were developers still trying to make changes in dev and test? Was it a case of they just didn't want to follow this process whatsoever? Or was it a case of there's something else going on? And the truth was there was something else going on. So there was a problem with this flow that I came up with, which was feature branch, pull request, go to dev, and then go to test. The problem with that was is that in order to get feedback from our QA folks and our business owner and our business analyst, we had to merge changes into main. Those changes were, un they were unfinished changes half the time. They wanted to have the capability to get that feedback before it was ready to be released out to production. And so I never asked why. And so if I did, I would have iterated on that process. And I would have said, okay, if I go out to a feature branch, I'm going to go to our development environment. If I push in any sort of changes to a feature branch, I want to go to a dev environment. Then once we get the feedback and we say, it's all good, then we do a pull request and we can start the release pipeline to test stage into production. Um, future iterations, uh, I'm actually like on V4 of the delivery pipeline in my head. Uh, we're leveraging ephemeral environments and everything like that, but that's really advanced. The other thing I wish I did was I wish I tracked key metrics. So I saw the Dora metric presentation done by Google, and that's basically what I wish I tracked because what we kept getting asked is, this is going to take us a lot of time and effort to convert over to this process from all the, you know, when we started rolling this out to all the teams. Like, why should we change this process? What's in it for me? And if I was tracking things like deployment frequency, deployment time, and failure rate, I would have been able to tell them, we dropped that 60% number down to 0% almost overnight. Not only that, those two-hour deployments that we had, those started getting reduced. Yeah, the first couple deployments was still about two hours because we're still learning the tool. We had a few configuration things. But as we learned the tool, the deployment time started decreasing, but we didn't have to verify as much because we weren't making the same stupid mistakes. And then we got a little bit better with the tool, a little bit faster with the tool, but the verification time kept decreasing. And then that increased our deployment frequency because, again, we, kept, we weren't making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. So then that reduced our change set over and over and over down to the point where we got to 15-minute deployments. I should have been shouting that from the mountaintops because if I went up to any team and I said, listen, if you adopt this process, you're going to go from two-plus-hour deployments down to 15 minutes and you're not going to have any emergency fixes the next day, they'd be like, how do I get in on some of that action? The last lesson was... I was the person that was responsible for this process. And I held that, I held on to that with the tightest of grips. I said, no one can make changes. They has to, everything has to come through me. And I basically, what I did is I just have basically recreated the throw it over the wall mentality of, you know what, it's ops problems now. There's a reason this meme exists. And so when you have a centralized team that focuses on just processes and platform engineering or DevX or anything like that, and they're the sole proprietors and the sole people who can make changes, you basically recreated this. So I encourage you to be as transparent as possible, but also be incredibly collaborative and encourage contributions. Because not everyone's going to want to know the nitty gritty details on everything. But at the same time, they're going to want, there's going to be a handful of people who do want to do that, and they do want to improve that. So encourage that. And listen to and respond to any sort of concerns. So that is it. 
Thank you very much. The QR code goes to my LinkedIn page, in case you're wondering. I will be out in the hall wearing the green hat if you have any additional questions. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.